E4 cross question tonight are Nick Thomas Simmons, uh, Labour MP for Torvain and Shadow International Trade Secretary, John Stevens, the political editor of the Daily Mirror, and Joanne Nadler, political commentator and author. We are also going to be joined uh, soon, we hope, by Kit Morthouse, the Conservative MP for North West Hampshire, who was, of course, Education Secretary in the uh, short lived Liz Truss government. Get your questions coming in 0345 606 What would you like to? To ask the panel, you can text 84850 or tweet us at LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question. Watch on Global Player. This is LBC. Right, we are going to start with a question from Mark in Kilburn, and it is about what we've been talking about so far on the show. Mark asks, would it be necessary to hold a referendum if a future government wanted to rejoin the European single market or the customs union? John. I think if you look at what's happening in Scotland at the moment, we've got the position where the government is saying to Nicola Sturgeon that we can't have another referendum on Scottish independence. And she's saying, well, if fine, if you won't let me have an election, then if the SNP does best at the general election, then that is a de facto referendum and then we'll leave. And the response to that from everyone I've spoken to uh, on the non SNP side has said that wouldn't be acceptable, that shouldn't be the case, that you would need another referendum. And I think the same goes for the Brexit debate. I think, I know there are some people out there who are totally gutted still that we left the EU. But I think most people have moved on. I don't think there is much appetite from many people to go back into those rows all over again. Just remember a few years ago, just outside here at Westminster, you had the chaos out on College Green. Mm. Absolutely terrible scenes where MPs felt unable to leave the Houses of Parliament because they'd be screamed at in the face. And it was such a mess. It was the most depressing time for a lot of MPs in Parliament. I just don't think most people want to go back to that. And we can have a debate, and we did so ahead of the referendum, on whether it would be better or worse to leave the EU and what impact would that have on the economy. But I think, to be truthful, the one thing we... And who knows what the answer is on that mm. one. You hear, still hear now people making both cases and saying the sums would be this, the sums would be that. But I think the one thing we can be certain of is that if people voted for something to happen and then they got told, you got it wrong, you're too stupid, mm. we're going to do something else. I think that would be permanently damaging for this country. There's that middle ground, isn't there? When you had, we had a few months ago, Tobias Elwood, senior Tory MP, uh, then we had it briefed that number 10 were looking at a closer relationship with you. That sparked a pretty furious backlash. Today, it's Andy Street's turn to be the Tory politician saying, look, guys, we need to have a rethink. Do you think it's inevitable, John? Is the direction of travel that we are heading for a closer relationship with Europe, even under a Tory government? Well, I think there's clearly some problems in the country current deal and how it's working and I'm sure you will see those ironed out but I don't think there is an appetite for many Tory voters or Tory MPs to do that I mean ask Nick what he thinks but I certainly I'm, don't think I, there I is an appetite to. for many Labour voters or Labour MPs mm. they know what happened in 2019 mm. the Tories promised to get Brexit done and Labour got absolutely thumped at the general election they did. And yet I did a phone in here on LBC yesterday asking what people thought of Keir Starmer's <laughs> shift towards being a bit more Brexity than he was when he ran for leader, Nick. And a few Labour voters rang in and said, Labour should be the party of Remain. I back Keir Starmer in the leadership contest. He's effectively betrayed me. He has been on quite a journey on Brexit, hasn't he? Well, I think that the in the leadership election, uh, Keir Starmer obviously set out uh, his position and he set out you know, about defending freedom of movement as we left the EU. But we have now left. That is that is the fact. And it is not now, in my view, in my judgment, in the national interest to reopen this debate around the customs union and around the single but has market. That, that debate hasn't been closed. That debate is ongoing. We have businesses saying we need closer alignment with the EU because we're struggling economically. Well, well firstly, Anna, I speak to businesses on a regular basis. And what businesses say to me they need more than anything is certainty. Now, it is certainly true, however, 
that there are holes we need to fix in the trade and cooperation agreement that's been negotiated. First and foremost, we need to fix the Northern Ireland Protocol, because unless that is dealt with, we can't then move on to the wider mm. matters. We need a, uh, a new uh, peace, or if you like, a, a new agreement with regard, we call it a veterinary agreement, an SPS agreement to allow animals, agri-food products, plant-based products to move more freely. Where services are concerned, we need to see mutual recognition of professional qualifications. We also, in my view, this is in the interests of the EU and the UK to have a new security pact. So absolutely, we need to be fixing that trade and cooperation agreement. But it isn't in the national interest to reopen the wider debate. Why is it not in the national interest, in your view, to rejoin the single market or look to do so? When we voted to leave, nobody said we will leave the single market of the customs union. Why is it not in the national interest to at least look at whether that might work for us now? So I think it would cause huge division, instability and indeed uncertainty. Yet more years uh, would be taken up with this debate. I don't think that's in the national interest. I think a pragmatic approach to the trade and cooperation agreement is by far the preferable way forward. Uh, Joanne, where are you on this? The questioner asked a very technical question. Would it be necessary to have a referendum if a future government mm. wanted to go into the single market? And the answer is absolutely, it would be necessary. Um, I don't agree with you, Ben, that the issue of the single market and leaving it wasn't made perfectly explicit during the Brexit campaign. It absolutely was. How? We had senior Brexiteers saying they wanted to stay in the single market. There were some that did, but I think at the core of the main argument in favour of it was the idea of regaining sovereignty. And you can't have sovereignty if you have that amount of, uh, of, of um, regulatory alignment, which the single market demands. So I think on a very, uh, the very technical answer to your questioner is yes, absolutely. I find myself amazingly very much in agreement with, with what Nick and John have said here. Um, but I don't think the question was necessarily, although perhaps leading towards whether we should be having this debate, it was really about the methodology, right. should that happen? And it, there would be no legitimacy to that decision if it wasn't put back to the British people. The idea of it having to be put back to the British mm. people is quite horrendous for all the reasons that we've said, uh, but it would have to be. Do you think, it, can you see that happening in the next few years, in the coming years, that there would be some sort of poll on not rejoining completely, but some sort of halfway house like the single market? No, I mean, I think there are always going to be people that will be arguing for some sort of measure of realigning in one way, shape or form. But I think the answer to that really depends on how successful things turn out in terms of the economy in the longer run. And uh, we'll just have to see. But um, it's interesting, obviously, that, that, that Nick and his party have now decided to, to really you know, distance themselves from a lot of what they've been saying in previous years. And that is, is both the right thing to do philosophically, but also pragmatically from their point of view. And I think if, if they were to win the next election and, and not be pushing for this, um, then the calls for it will have to come from, from, outside, from outside government. They're not going to come from a Conservative Party if they're in opposition. Um, so... John, just before we move on, do you do you buy what Keir Starmer is saying, or is it all just political posturing? This is a man who, as we're hearing, campaigned three years ago, promising to bring back freedom of movement. Now says there's a red line for him when it comes to the EU. Well, I think we have to be slightly careful with what exactly did Keir Starmer promise. The pledge was to. I can't remember the exact wording, but was maintain freedom of movement as we leave the Fenders. EU. Bring back was also also it's not on the block. But we're now three years on. I mean, I think. This is something that Rishi Sunak has used to attack Keir Starmer. Mm. But Rishi Sunak doesn't seem to be able to keep any of the pledges he made just a few months ago. And so things have moved on. You know, people have moved on. And I think that Keir Starmer can see that most people in the country don't want to open up this kind of worms again. Q. Let 03456060973 the number to call to have your say on this if you want to put a question to our panel text me at 84850 tweet at LBC let's go to Ulf in Hamburg Ulf good evening what's your question good evening uh, my question would be um, if you actually seek the, um, cl a closer relationship with the EU what would you have to offer to make it worth the EU's while to re-enter into negotiations? It was quite onerous the last time. So do you think, Ulf, that they actually wouldn't want us back, even if we did want to re-enter? 
uh, as a member, I consider it highly unlikely. And it depends on the trouble uh, it would mean. If you just uh, accept all the conditions and rejoin the single market, yeah, maybe. But you will uh, you will make demands and that will take years of negotiations. Why bother? I mean, uh, you keep saying you're the biggest trading partner of the EU, but you only six you only represent six percent of our trade. So if we lo- lose one sixth of that, it's one percent. If we regain one half of that, it's half a percent of our trade. So is it really worth the trouble? Oh, thank you. Uh, Joanne, on the question of what the UK could offer the EU, if we are going to make this relationship work, both sides need to be willing to do that. And what have you made of the UK's behaviour, response over the last six years? Over the last six years, well, <laughs> obviously a great deal has changed, not least our, our constitutional arrangement with regards to Europe, and that's why we're having this discussion. Um, but again, just, just to, to hone in on, on, mm. on what the caller is, is getting at, I think that, you know, one of the reasons that, that uh, many of us felt strongly that we, uh, we were better off outside the EU is that the direction of travel within the e- EU of the member states was to closer alignment. Uh, and which was something that that we didn't want for Britain, but we didn't feel we had the right to tell those member states that it wasn't for them. So again, answering his question in a rather technical way, I can see that it probably, you know, it would not be to the advantage of those countries that, that want to um, move ever closer and mm. have something like a United States of Europe to have Britain back in again, creating problems, quite frankly. But, I mean, in terms of what Britain can bring to the EU, I mean, let, you know, let, let's not be modest about the, the, the degree of influence and soft power that Britain still has. Um, we have only have to look, even, you know, with, with the sort of tumultuous domestic uh, politics that we've had over the last couple of years, nevertheless, you know, Britain has led the way in many, in many respects uh, in terms of bringing together the coalition with regards to Ukraine. Uh, we were out there in front with, uh, with developing the vaccine, whatever one thinks of that. Um, I mean, there are many ways uh, that the way that we have our, you know, our science and tech sector. I mean, Nick can talk to this because of his brief. I mean, there are many ways in which Britain can contribute to the EU and be a, be a helpful uh, friend and partner without actually having to submerge our government within the European Union. Nick, you talked a bit before about some of the specific things, some of the specific agreements you'd like to see signed with the EU. More generally, how would a Labour government approach that relationship and how would that be different to how Conservative governments have done in recent years? Well, we would approach it in the spirit of partnership. And just to give an example, I think your your caller has called in from Hamburg. Mm. I uh, had a, a very productive breakfast meeting only in recent weeks with German businesses that have a footprint here in the UK. And yes, as as Joanne says, there is there is huge respect for UK innovation, science and technology. But also, there was a real agreement that what we don't need to do is to continue to erect unnecessary trade barriers. Nobody wants to see that, so there's that common interest. But in addition to that, there is a real commonality of interest on security, both in terms of tackling organised crime right across Europe, but also in terms of the European unity Mm. on issues like tackling climate change, tackling global poverty, and indeed standing up to Putin after the illegal uh, invasion of Ukraine. John, just on the politics of this, if the two main parties are saying, as it strikes me, they are fairly similar things when it comes to Brexit at the moment, is there a risk that they both lose support to the parties that are a bit more definitive, shall we say? With Nigel Farage is talking about potential comeback on the right, on the left, some Labour voters potentially switching to the Lib Dems and the Greens. Is, is that a risk or is that overstated? I think it's possibly more of a risk on the right-hand side than the left side, but... I can see that there is a danger here that people can say, oh, Rishi Sunak is going a bit softer on Brexit than Boris Johnson. I'm not sure there is loads of evidence for that at the moment. I think it's easy for people who are part of the Reform Party to try and talk that Mm. up. People like Nigel Farage to kind of bring the issue live again. But I think at the moment, without Nigel Farage, Reform Party struggles to get talked about. I know it's doing okay in the polls, but it isn't doing 
great. And I think if I was Rishi Sunak, I wouldn't be terribly concerned about that at the moment. But I mean, just just go back to the caller and what he was saying. I used to work in Brussels. I was Brussels correspondent for a different newspaper to the one I work for now <laughs> in different circumstances <laughs> before the referendum. Um, back when I was there, it was, it was the run up to referendum. It was when we were going through David Cameron's renegotiation, which took up a lot of energy and then as soon as he got it people here thought it was a bit rubbish and then he never mentioned it again which caused people in the EU a lot of upset then obviously in the aftermath of the Mm. referendum we went through all of those different kind of negotiations and different votes in parliament and slight tweaks and I think that speaking to people in Brussels they're saying some of the things to off that They've moved on. You know, there are so many issues on their plate at the moment that they want to sort out that kind of going back into this and it going on for negotiations for years after years, they're just not up for it. And I think they now see with the Northern Ireland Protocol that there are problems and that that does need to be sorted. But do they want a wider renegotiation of absolutely everything? Definitely not. Interesting. Lots more to talk about, lots more to talk about with our panel. Kit Morthouse, the former cabinet minister, also hopefully joining us in the next few minutes. Keep your calls coming in, 0345 973. Let me know what you would like to put to our panel. The time now, 8.18. LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question. Tweet at LBC. 8.21 the time here on LBC. Do keep your questions coming in for our panel. 0345 973 the number to call. Text me on 84850. Tweet us at LBC. Robert has got in touch from Lambeth. Robert says, how much more disruption can we put up with before we tell Just Stop Oil to just go home? Nick. Talk today of Rishi Sunak urging police to take a tougher approach. Is that something you'd support? We, we, we just think that this 
is not working, I'm afraid. Of course, we are very passionate about tackling climate change. That's why we put forward a climate investment pledge of £28 billion each and every year uh, in the next parliament. But the problem is we are here discussing the tactics. We're discussing the disruption. It is not achieving the purpose of promoting the debate on climate. And I really do fear it's becoming completely counterproductive and it's putting people off who otherwise would be listening to the substance of this debate rather than actually the methods that are being used. What needs to be done differently by the politicians, the government, by the police? Well, I can remember, you know, when I was in the, the Shadow Home Affairs brief talking to the police about this, I do think that it's wrong to start making criticisms of police making operational decisions. I think they have to make operational decisions in the particular circumstances, taking into account the danger that's prevented. However, I do think that there are also powers that are available to the police, and I think the police are perfectly entitled to take action to stop this disruption. Do you think they're not making enough use of the powers they do I, I'm have not, at the moment? I'm not going to start criticising... seem to be what you're saying. No, no, I'm not going to criticise police for the decisions they have to make on the front line because they often have to make decisions in very, very difficult sure, circumstances. Sure, but you can say whether you but, think but they've, clearly, they've got them right but or clearly, wrong. clearly... Clearly, well, there are so many different situations. I think it would be unfair to do that. However, the, the powers are available and it's for the police to use them appropriately. Do you think the powers that they have are sufficient? There were talk last week in PMQs. One Tory MP wants them to be effectively as prescribed organisation, just to boil. No, I mean, I think that was just rhetoric from the Tory back backbenchers. I think this is about having pragmatic powers that are available. There are a set of powers that are available to the police now. And, of course, we give our police full support in using them. Joanne? I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by Nick's answer because I, I feel as if you're being slightly ambivalent about whether you think the police have got the right powers or not. Now, I realise that social media can be very misleading, but there do seem to be a lot of pictures of the police sort of effectively mollycoddling some of these uh, protesters. In fact, I'm going to stop myself. I don't think we should call them protesters. They're not really protesting. They are disrupting. These are not legitimate protests in any sense of the word. This is a sort of performative and hysterical kind of cult uh, that seems to have sucked in a lot of, um, I think, you know, vulnerable young people in some senses. And I think you only have to look really at the comparison between what these people are doing in a country where they have every legitimate way of being involved in politics and making their case compared with the absolute bravery of what we're seeing at the moment in Iran and in China, where people live in authoritarian states and are, are literally risking their lives and those of their families to come out and protest against true tyranny. Uh, and quite frankly, I don't think, um, you know, the people that are disrupting the roads in and around London and the rest of the country and threatening to throw themselves off gantries and all the rest of it, you know, really deserve to be seen in, the, in, in a comparison as, as legitimate protesters at all. Doesn't what we've seen, I take your point, Gemma, but what, what we're seeing in China and Iran, doesn't that emphasise the importance of the right to free protest? You say it's not protesting, it's disrupting, but protests are often disrupting. No, absolutely, but these people do have the right to free protest. They can, they can protest freely without disruption. But for all sorts of protests are disruption. Well, no, what they, what they don't want is they don't accept that the majority of people don't agree with them. And therefore, they're not interested in having the kind of protests that we've, we saw uh, that, you know, you, we see in London all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to make this the, London centric The streets centric. of London are often closed to allow marches against the Iraq war, against yeah, and, and people Black can, Lives and Matter. People, exactly. And people can make their plans around them. They are police. They're done in, in, in coordination uh, with, with uh, the, the, the emergency services so that people can go about their, their business and they're not actually stopping people in their tracks. I mean, this but is a kind the of cult that's trying to, to undermine the capitalism. Have to be closed so that people can march through central London. They are yeah, by nature people disrupted. can make alternative plans. And I think that's absolutely right. The right to protest is absolutely right. So, so it's not the vital. disruption that's your issue. It's the lack of prior notice. It's the lack of warning that just stop oil don't give people. It's, it's just the purely performative nature of it. I mean, of course, as you say, a legitimate process can, protest rather can be disruptive. But... We, we work around it. We're, we're able to accommodate it. I don't think these people want to be accommodated. I don't think that's what they're trying to achieve. John, come to you in just a moment. Nick, though, Joanne says you're being ambivalent about whether you support what the police are doing. I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm very supportive of frontline police officers. The point that I was making is that I, I don't like it when 
politicians sat here in the safety of a studio st- suddenly start criticising frontline officers in very difficult situations with the decisions that they make. And that's the point I was making. No, but the, um, the ambivalence, if you don't mind, was over whether or not the police had the right uh, measures available then to them. I, I, and if you're suggesting that they do, but they're not taking them, that's where I, I wasn't quite clear what you were trying to say. You know, I, I think the, the, the framework that exists does contain the powers that are necessary but of course if the um if the police made different arguments about additional powers you would always listen to that but i think the framework is there the framework is clear and we back the police to use it john what do you think i would just question whether these protests are being effective in getting what they want it's only a couple of months ago we were talking about insulate britain they had a good idea that people's homes weren't properly insulated and one of the ways that we could help people who were struggling with the cost of living crisis one of the ways we could help them is by making sure their homes were better insulated it would mean that their electricity and gas bills could go down also environmentally friendly all very sensible things but I think the government wasn't willing to listen to them wasn't willing to do what they wanted because else it would look like they were giving in to blackmail and as much as it was a sensible argument they were ignored by the government because of the tactics they were using and i think we're seeing that a repeat of that again is the tory party who run our country at the moment going to suddenly change how they operate because people shutting down motorways. No, it's not. They're just going to take firmer and firmer action against the people protesting and the people who are suffering the consequences of what they're doing. We all know it It is people who are low paid, who are self-employed, who are paid by the hour, who are unable to get to their jobs. And I just think it's slightly unfortunate that Every time these protesters get interviewed on radio to um, radio interviews, they all seem to be rather lardy da posh public school kids who can afford to go and sit in a road all day rather than working, and the people who suffer the people who are working hard. Isn't there an argument that, John, that despite all the disruption, despite all the frustration, the anger, they have succeeded in getting people talking about the issue as well? They've got it on the agenda in a way that it wasn't before. Since the Extinction Rebellion process, climate change has shot up the political agenda. Oh, what mention have we had in the last five minutes when we've been talking about this, about any of the issues of climate change and what you do about coal power or kind of targets around the world? Or We haven't talked about that at all. We've just talked about people on roads. You know, that takes up all the conversation and the real issues they want to get talked about don't get talked about at all. OK. Another text question here from Jenny in Manchester. Jenny asks, could the anti-COVID restriction protests in China threaten Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping's rule? I don't know if we've got any China experts on the panel. Who wants to have a crack at that one? Nick, what do you make of what we've seen in, in, uh, in China? Well, it's extraordinarily worrying. We've seen a BBC journalist, it seems, arrested and indeed assaulted. So never has it been more important to defend a defend freedom of press all around the world, first of all. That was particularly shocking. But secondly, it isn't just about these pro- these protests, extraordinarily brave though the protesters are. It is about the whole attitude of the Chinese regime to freedom of expression. And we should be speaking through all the diplomatic channels that we have to make absolutely clear our views on this to that regime. Joanne, presumably you'd agree with that. On the wider issue, though, some criticism of Rishi Sunak from his own party this week for not taking a tough enough stance when it comes to China. Where are you on, on the wider issue? Well, I mean, uh, the Prime Minister's giving a speech this evening, isn't he, um, under the guise of, uh, what is it, prag- pragmatic, uh, trenchant pragmatism or something, robust pragmatism, um, with particularly mm. with regards to China. And I do wonder exactly what that phrase means it seems a little bit um a contradiction in terms in some ways i mean i i regret that he is not taking the same sort of bullish stance regarding china that liz truss um, liz truss offered to do um whilst also accepting that you know the leader of, of any western nation has to assess um carefully how it deals with china however this does seem to be it does seem to be a moment. It seems to be an opportunity for the West to stand up and, and really make a statement of support for the protesters. I somehow doubt that... 
I fear that we're not going to have the the the, uh, the self belief to do that because our economies are so intertwined with China. That said, you know the Chinese economy is not growing as fast as some of the de other democracies, the Pan Asian democracies, which we would be much better off making trade with. Um, but the other issue that looms, it seems to me, is exactly what the role of China is in terms of its uh, geopolitical uh, negotiations with regards to Ukraine, Russia, which I also think limits our uh, capacity to stand up. Uh, but I wish we would. It's true, John, isn't it? It's a pretty difficult moment for Rishi Sunak to be standing up, effectively arguing for a more, more pragmatic approach to China, just days after, oh, as, as in fact, they've arrested BBC journalists and cracking down on peaceful protesters. Yeah, and it's another issue where Rishi Sunak is flip-flopped all over the place. During the leadership contest in the summer, he said that China was our number one threat, had these big graphics out on his Twitter feed saying that it's promising that he was going to face down China. As soon as he got into number Number 10 and went off to his first proper world summit, the G20 in Bali. He got accused by his backbenchers of totally softening his position. He wanted to meet Xi. He seemed to have completely changed his tune. I think in his speech tonight, we hear that he's going to harden up his language again. That, yeah, I do think it does look particularly awkward for him. I think that's why he's veering all over the road with his kind of stance on China. Lots more to come in just a moment. We're going to be talking about Labour's new policy on private schools. Talk about that more at nine o'clock, but I'll put that to the panel too in just a moment. First at the time, 8.32, let's get the latest news headlines from Charlotte Morgan. Police have shot a man inside a property in Somerset as part of an investigation into a possible firearms offence. The man in his 30s is said to be in a critical but stable condition after they were called to Wick St Lawrence earlier. Despite growing unrest, officials in China say they're sticking with their zero COVID policy. There have been more, pro more protests across the country with people unhappy about things like quarantines and snap lockdowns. And National Grid says it won't need a scheme aimed at preventing blackouts tomorrow. After all, it had warned the plan which pays households to cut their peak time power usage may be brought in because of problems with supplies from France. LBC weather showers mostly easing tonight but could still be heavy in Shetland and in the far southeast, dry and chilly elsewhere with a low of minus one. A cool dry day tomorrow with a mixture of fog and some sunshine highs of 11 degrees. This is LBC.
Cross Question on LBC. Call 0345 6060973. 8.37 the time. With me in the studio, Labour uh, MP and Shadow International Trade Secretary Nick Timmer-Simmons, uh, Dick Timmer-Simmons, Joanne Nadler, political commentator and author, and John Stevens, the political editor of the Daily Mirror. Still waiting on Tory MP, former cabinet minister Kit Malthouse. He's been waylaid by a vote in the House of Commons, but we're hoping he'll be with us shortly. Do keep your questions coming in. 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Tweet at LBC. Uh, Sandra in London has texted. Keir Starmer says he would still remove the charitable status of private schools and the tax breaks that come with that to fund fund to find funding for state schools. How would the panel improve funding for state schools? Nick, this raises, I think, £1.6 billion. Why is uh, ending charitable status on private schools the right approach? Well, firstly, the money would fund 6,500 teachers. It would fund mental health counselling for... Uh, and give access to that counselling for all pupils in state schools, which is around about 93% of the cohort. But let me just explain why I do think this is a sensible and fair approach. Uh, I went to a local state school in the constituency I now represent. I was then lucky enough to go to Oxford University, where I, where I was subsequently uh, a lecturer, and I taught uh, students from a range of backgrounds, from the independent sector, from grammar schools, and indeed from non-selective state schools. Uh, But what I found was that there were people who went to the school I did who had just as much talent Mm. as those independently educated students that I taught who didn't have the same opportunities. Those who go and are educated in our independent sector, those who are lucky enough to have rich parents who can allow uh, that, they are uh, very, very lucky. But all we are trying to do here is to equalise it a bit, to equalise those life chances. And by saying that the charitable status ends, by putting VAT on those uh, private school fees, it just gives us some money to make that situation more equal for those people that I saw who, frankly, didn't have the same... It, it might make it slightly more equal, Nick. I, take to, I agree with you on that. But ultimately, if you want to really make it equal, you would phase out or abolish private schools completely. If you want to, if you're worried about inequalities in the education system, shouldn't that be Labour's position? Well, I think what you have to do is you have to balance up here different things. You don't want to go around our school system destroying good schools, uh, nor do you want to take away the ability, and some parents do this, who want to uh, pay for their uh, children to be educated. What we're saying is, if you are having the ability to do that, if you are having the ability to have all the advantages that come with a private school education, you know, dominance of the most powerful jobs in society, you're likely to earn far more money. All we're asking in that situation is that VAT is paid, so you have that money you can then invest on the 93% that don't go to those schools. But do you have an issue with the principle that someone can, to use your phrase, buy dominance in professions, buy that advantage if they've got the money to do it? Shouldn't, shouldn't the other Labour Party, shouldn't that be the, the focus? Because the world is as it is, and I don't think it is in the national interest, as I've said, to go around destroying good schools, but it is in the national interest to have equality of opportunity right across society. And what this very modest proposal does is to just provide a sum of money where we could improve the lot of pupils in state schools, Mm. whilst the freedom for people to send their children privately is still there. How can you have equality of opportunity if people can buy a better education that others can't afford? Well, what you can do is seek to equalise it as a government as much as you possibly can, and that's exactly what a Labour government would do. We've talked about this proposal. We have another proposal, for example, on school breakfast clubs where we would be funding from ending the non-DOM tax status. But that focus of improving education for the 93% is absolutely where Labour's focus is. Joanne, what do you make of where Labour's ended up on this? I think it's a complete um, mishmash, quite frankly. I think it's a really, really um, ill-thought-out piece of policy, uh, which is virtue signalling, which is Keir Starmer throwing some red meat to his party because there's so little, in many ways, between the two main parties on some of the bigger issues. And so he's grasping around trying to find something to to give Labour a bit of distinctive policy. And it's this and it's the House of Lords. 
uh, you know, the, the old songs that the Labour, Labour left like. I mean, bottom line is, is this going to actually achieve any of the things that Nick wants it to? I, I think that's highly doubtful. But a bigger question is, are those the sort of things that we want to achieve anyway? Surely the point is that if there is excellence in the independent sector, rather than stamping on it and squashing it and restricting it only to people who are very wealthy, um, uh, what you want to do is examine what makes those schools good and, and transfer that approach into the state sector where appropriate. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is, not, <laughs> very, this is not about levelling up in any sense whatsoever. Uh, this is really about, you know, reducing aspiration. And the thing is that those big name schools that everybody associates with, uh, with, with public schools, they will survive this because they'll have a lot of money in the coffers. It's those smaller independent schools that have sprung up uh, throughout the country that are doing, you know, specific roles in, in areas where they're not actually charging huge amounts of money um, that appeal to uh, aspirational lower middle class, middle class parents. Those are the ones that are really going to suffer as a result of this move. And I think it's completely, completely counterproductive. Counterproductive virtue signaling, Nick, and uh, hit attacks on aspiration, would you say? Uh, absolutely not. And, you know, public school fees and the private school fees have increased in recent years and it hasn't had the, the impact that's been suggested. What there is, is a very effective lobbying group here, the Independent Schools Council. They can get front pages in the tabloids. They can get the Chancellor of the Exchequer quoting their statistics without even any criticism of them. Uh, and, you know, it's an organisation I know well from the time that I spent in university admissions. But frankly, I do not believe for a moment that we'll have the negative effects it would suggest. What it is, is a modest proposal that will redistribute some of that opportunity to most of the students who go to our uh, education system. It's not going to be radical enough for the people that want this kind of policy. Um, so I don't think it's going to satisfy your, the, you know, the left wing of the Labour Party. Sorry. And it's it's not fundamental enough to, it, it, it's just... A, yeah, it it's, is a bit of a halfway house, isn't it? That's what I was trying to get at. If you are opposed to private education, fine. If you support it, fine. But this seems to me, it does seem a bit of a mishmash, as Joanne says. It's a says. moderate, sensible, pragmatic proposal that will improve the lot of many children in the state sector who should be our focus. And all of these children that are going to be removed from independent schools I, as a result of this, how are they? where are they going to go I to don't school? Believe and what that. about these 6,500 teachers that you say are going to be I don't believe that for a minute. The, the Independent Schools Council came up with this figure of 90,000 children would, that would have to move from the independent sector to the state sector. Uh, it, it doesn't you stand they up came to scrutiny. Up with it? Frankly, well, they did. They, 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 and it's from 2018, I believe, that they so came up. So there could be even more of them now. And the Chancellor of the Exchequer is willing to quote that without any criticism at all. If you look at where well, you just quoted it, absolutely, and I'm quoting it because they use it as evidence that somehow this this policy won't work. When actually, when public school fees and private school fees have increased, it hasn't had the impact that they suggest. They're just a very effective lobbying group. And what's happened is that those kind of prestige schools, they've now got more and more people coming in from China, uh, from Russia, buying, buying into that education and actually, uh, you know, taking their expertise back to their countries rather than making it uh, something that we can share in the economy here. John's been waiting very patiently. But come on, Joanne. I mean, people on the minimum wage have to pay VAT on a whole number of things, on fuel, on electricity and gas, if they want to go and get a fry up in the coffee shop around the corner, they have to v pay VAT and they get expected yeah, to... Yeah, I think VAT is a very, very unreasonable tax. I mean, it is a regressive tax and perhaps we should be slashing VAT. That's a different discussion. But if some of the poorest families in our country are expected to pay it on the basic items that they are buying, then well-off families who are lucky enough to be able to afford these private school fees can surely but, but pay the, it on but that the, well. You're falling into a cliche here. There are lots of parents who who aspire to do the best for their children. And perhaps they, you know, they don't want um, expensive foreign holidays or expensive cars or whatever. They are saving to give their, their child what they perceive to be a better chance by sending them to a particular type of school, whether that's because it's selective, you know, rigorous in terms of its, 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 uh, its academic standards or whatever. And I think in a free society, you know, you should be allowed to do that. 
But in a free society, there's all sorts of things that you have to pay tax on and you just deal with it. That's we're still in a free society. I think society. it's really so I think it's really important that, that the pressure is put on independent schools to live up to their charitable status so that they should do more work in the community. They should offer more bursaries. A lot of them spend a huge amount of money on uh, building theatres and swimming pools and all sorts of glossy kind of uh, equipment, which seems to me to be slightly missing the point. If that's what you're buying into, then I can quite understand why people standing back would say, well, quite frankly, that's a luxury, perhaps it should be taxed. But I'm talking about the quality of teaching, the approach to the curriculum, uh, you know, how rigorous they are in terms of their entry criteria, that kind of thing. And that should be open to as many people as possible. I absolutely agree with you. But you do that through living up to the standards required by charitable states. But they're not going to live up to those expectations if there isn't a threat that if they don't, that there will be some sort of punishment. That's the whole way that you persuade them to actually do that. Nick, very briefly. The, The chair of the headmaster and headmistresses conference last year was speaking about the benefit to state schools, but couldn't actually quantify what it was. So I think we've had long enough to live up to the charitable status and it's time it went. Okay, more to come in just a moment. The time now, 8.47. LBC. question on LBC. Lots of texts coming in about Labour's policy on private schools, which is great, because as it happens, we are talking about that <laughs> from <laughs> nine o'clock. So if you've got a view on that, 03456060973, the number to call. The panel don't agree. Wonder what you make of it. Uh, for now, though, let's get back to your questions for our panel. Uh, political commentator Joanne, Nick Thomas-Simmons from uh, Labour, and John Stevens, the political editor of The Daily Mirror. Ali has texted from Poplar asking the panel, uh, two men and two teenage boys have been murdered in London since Saturday alone. Is our capital becoming lawless? John. 
I think that a lot of people in London do have worries about the levels of crime. And I think, you know, those murders of those two 16-year-old boys is not far from where I live in South East London. You do just think that is absolutely appalling that children so young are being dragged into what we presume must be some sort of gang violence. I think that is worrying. And I think... No, I don't think we're in a ruleless society, lawless society. Lawless society. Clearly, we're not in a lawless society. I think that most people follow the law. People aren't getting kind of stabbed and shot on every street corner. But I think it's clearly happening too much. And I think there's questions for politicians on all sides about that. And are we investing the right amount of resources in policing? And this isn't the thing that's causing it. I'm not going to exaggerate it. But just going back to one of our earlier topics on Just Stop Oil, when you see the huge numbers of police officers, you see it out around the corner from here when you have vans after van after van of police officers having to come out and deal with people gluing themselves in the road or whatever they're doing. I'm not saying if that stopped the, and the, you'd be able to solve crime in London. I'm completely realistic about that. But I do think it does put extra pressure on police. And I think that we all know people in London who have been burgled or have been involved in some sort of hate crime. They've tried to get the police involved and you just can't get people to deal with it. And I think it is very frustrating for them when they see the police having to go out en masse just to keep our roads open. Joanne? Um, I mean... <sighs> What a, what a horrific weekend we've, we've just lived through in London. And I know it's not just London. There's been a, some terrible things in Manchester mm. as well. And I'm sure we don't even hear about things that are happening all over the country. Um, I, I agree with John, though. I think we've got to be careful not to lapse into the idea that we're living in a, in a lawless country. And, and actually, an, an arrest has already been made in the case of the murder of these two poor teenage boys. Um, Nevertheless, I feel as though something is is awry in London. There really is a sense that um, Sadiq Khan has presided over uh, an increase in violent crime um, during his period as mayor, and he doesn't seem to have got a grip on it. He is the police and crime commissioner. Um, and we hear all sorts of uh, curious statements from him about the menopause and tampons and uh, all sorts of sort of virtue signaling things, and yet, he hasn't got a grip on what absolutely should be his his key role as as mayor of London. There are, you know, a lot of complex reasons as to why this kind of crime happens. I'm not holding him personally responsible for all of that, but he should be accountable for the performance of the Metropolitan Police, and it hasn't been good enough in this area. What's he done specifically that you think he shouldn't have done on this, Joe? I mean, a lot of people say it's Sadiq Khan's fault, but what specifically? Well, would it's you not like so much what, what he's done. I think it's what he what he hasn't done, and it's it's what a pity. Hasn't he done it's a well, it's a pity that we didn't have um, Kit Malthouse here this evening because, of course, when he was working with uh, Boris Johnson as his um, uh, on the Police and Crime Commission in London, um, we were living through a kind of similar period in terms of a spike, particularly in knife crime. And they were able, through a number of you know concerted efforts, presumably changing the nature of neighbourhood policing to a certain extent, to, to, to get something of a control over it. I mean, I'm not suggesting for one minute that it's a straightforward thing. It absolutely is not. Um, but I, I feel as though we just don't have a sense that he's in charge and he's in control of the situation. Adam. Nick, is that Khan's fault? Because violent crime is up in every single police force area of England and Wales. It isn't just an exclusively London problem. I'm afraid what we've had over the past 12 and a half years it is now is the decimation of neighbourhood policing, both in terms of the reduction in frontline officers, because the additional officers being recruited at the moment in the uplift are not going to replace the officers that have been lost since 2010. And in addition to that, we've had severe cuts to police civilian staff, meaning that officers who otherwise would be engaged in frontline duty are having to backfill those facilities as well. So it's absolutely crucial that we put neighbourhood policing at front and centre of our efforts to tackle this. But we have to tackle as well the underlying causes of crime. We have to tackle the underlying reasons why it is that young people 
do fall into the gang violence and fall into the uh, life of crime that none of us on the panel would want to see them uh, falling into. So we have to tackle both those things, enforcement, but the causes of crime as well. OK, I want to move on because I want to squeeze in Ashley in Bournemouth's question. Ashley asked, BT have awarded its workers a £1,500 pay rise in order to end their strikes, with some getting up to a 16% pay rise. Does the government still have a case for not doing the same for nurses and rail companies for their workers too. Nick, should ministers give nurses and other public sector workers a pay rise of, well, in this case, 16%, an inflation match pay rise? Well, I can't comment on the specifics of the percentage because I'm not close enough to the negotiations, but clearly the government uh, does need to get involved and needs to actually move to find a settlement. The government in these strikes has either been sat on the sidelines doing nothing or, in some cases throwing metaphorical grenades into the negotiations to make the situation even worse. They need to do the hard, unglamorous work of sitting down and finding a resolution. You might not be able to put a specific figure on it. Would a Labour government offer a bigger pay rise than this government is? The Labour, Labour will look to grow the economy and, of course, yeah, be in a, a position a to, pay fair, to pay fairer wages, of course we but, would. But that is in our DNA. you criticise the government and then on the one hand and then on the other hand not say that you would do it differently well, well, when no, it comes to the... Well, well, no, no, hang on, hang on. We, the books are not, have not been opened to us by the government yet. At the, at the moment, we are looking from the outside in, urging the government to sit down and reach a solution. What I can't do is cut across negotiations so I'm not even in the room to say precisely uh, where the compromise position is. The Royal College of Nursing, of course, wants a 17% pay rise. Joanne, is that realistic in your view? Probably not. Um, I think, broadly speaking, the government is correct that um, the public sector and obviously your, your caller has raised the issue of, of a private sector company um, going for an above inflation pay rise. Um, but I don't think BT is a big enough um, conglomerate to, you know, to, to, to sort of set the level of pay across the rest of the economy. And there may be specific reasons why they felt that that was appropriate in their case. Uh, but we, you know, none of us will be getting a pay rise if inflation continues and we don't get on top of the inflation wage price spiral. So I think uh, re reluctantly, because, uh, you know, so some of the cases uh, for uh, wage increases are, are very strong, undoubtedly. Mm. Uh, but we have to cut the cloth that we have available to us. And I think, broadly speaking, you know, the government is correct to try to, to sort of dampen down expectations, albeit they will have to respond to some of these particular disputes with specific uh, offers. John, just lastly, how, how difficult do you think this could get for the government in the coming months and potentially also for Labour, given their current line on it? Yeah, well, you think that at the start of this, when it was just the rail unions, the Tory government seemed to be quite enjoying this. This was something that kind of throw it, kiss Starmer and say this is somehow all your fault, although they're kind of argument didn't seem particularly logical when they're the ones in charge. I think it has become a lot more difficult for them. It's really hard to paint nurses as the bogeymen when you've got people like the Royal College of Nurses. They are not some kind of out there Marxist trots. They are very reasonable. It is the first time in their 106 year history that they're talking about a national strike. And at the moment, the government's position, Steve Barclay, the health secretary, is that they're not going to have any talks at all on pay. And I think as we go into the winter, if this continues, we know we've got two strike dates in December, possibly more in January, then I'm not sure that is a sustainable way to go forward. OK, we are almost out of time, but final uh, text question says, Matt Hancock seems to have somehow won the public back on I'm a Celeb. Is he set for a return to the political mainstream? In a line, in a sentence, please. Uh, Nick? He should be set for a return to work and serving his constituents. Joanne? Please, God, no. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. Well, that was pretty decisive. That was pretty resounding. Uh, thank you to our panellists. Thank you to Dan. Thank you to Nick. Thank you to John for your time. Thank you for all your questions, uh, calls, texts and tweets on that. Coming up after news, we're going to be talking more about what we discussed with the panel, the Labour position on private schools. Keir Starmer wants to end their charitable tax status, which would increase fees by up to 20%. Is that the right approach? Is it an indefensible policy to give... The schools that are preserved often of the wealthy a tax break, or is this just Labour playing politics with education? That's next. On your radio, on Global Player. 
and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock. A man has been shot by police in a village in Somerset. LBC's Heather Cartwright has more. Police went to the house in Wix and Lawrence investigating possible firearm offences. It was then that a man in his 30s who was inside the property was shot by officers. They gave him first aid before he was taken to Southmead.